Good afternoon. It is a pleasure to open this open lecture uh, on behalf of the CAPES School of Advanced Studies on Water and Society Under Change, hosted by the Escola de Ingeniería de São Carlos, Universidad, Universidad de São Paulo, at São Carlos campus. It's our pleasure to receive in this third module our visiting professor, uh, Professor Dimitri Solomatini, uh, first time in our campus. And also for this opening, we invited people representing different institutions and uh, uh, units of uh, the University of Sao Paulo, Paulo campus in Sao Carlos. Uh, well, first of all, our director, Professor Edson Venland, who is bringing his first uh, words. Thank you for coming, Professor. Thank you, Professor Menjondo. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, <clears throat> it's a great pleasure for us at the Engineering School of São Carlos to welcome Professor Dimitri Solomatin, who is the head of the Hydroinformatics Chair Group. Um, I would like also to congratulate Professor Mario Menjondo for the organization of a new lecture of our uh, advanced school in hydrology and society under change. So, and it's really a great pleasure for our engineering school to have so many uh, researchers from all over the world coming to São Carlos and sharing the knowledge with our students and even through the internet to, by the, to this transmission. So I would really like to congratulate all of you and welcome all of the students that are having part on this lecture. So welcome, Professor Dimitri. Thank you very much. Thank you. Obrigado, Professor Edson Vedland, Director of the School of Engineering. Uh, also, this, is, uh, this event is promoted by CAPES and also partially with FAPES and CNPQ, and also several interdisciplinary groups uh, and for the academy. One of these groups is the uh, Research and Innovation uh, uh, Center of Applied Mathematics for Industry, the semi cepit hosted by our Institute of Applied Mathematics uh, and computing science in, in this campus. And also Gustavo Faria is on behalf of this center who has also the initial words. Thank you. I will speak in Portuguese because I will have to speak rapidly. So I will not be able to speak so rapidly in English about the CMA. And I think that... But my presentation is in English, so... I think it will be a little more easy. It will be easier for you to understand. I will be able to see Perfect. Uh, existe aqui no, no campus de São Carlos, nós temos um CEPID, né? na verdade são três CEPIDs aqui, né? que é o, o maior projeto que pode existir na FAPESP. Né? Tem um que fica aqui no Instituto de Ciências Matemáticas e Computação e tem dois na Física. Né? Eu vou falar desse. No, o, a equipe ela é composta por 33 professores que são é, Principal Investigators, né, que são os pesquisadores principais, e 73 pesquisadores associados. Tá? Dentre esses pesquisadores, nós temos dois aqui. São o professor Mário Mediondo e o professor Edson Wendland. São pesquisadores do CMI também. Né, nós temos esses números de pós-docs, de, de doutorandos, variam a cada dia. Chegam novos, saem, saem alguns. Então, é mais ou menos essa média que a gente tem. Tá? É, ele está espalhado por todo, por todo o estado de São Paulo. Né? A, a, a sede é aqui no ICMC, mas nós temos professores no ICMC, na Federal, na Unesp, em, em Bauru, em Rio Preto, em Botucatu. Nós temos em São Paulo, na Poli, no, no IME, nós temos no IAE. O atual presidente do CNPq é um pesquisador do, do CMEAI. Tá? No, na Unicamp, lá no IMEC. Então, a gente está espalhado por todo, todo o Estado. Né? As principais áreas de pesquisa do CMI são essas três. A área de otimização e, e, otimização e pesquisa operacional. Né? Então, nós temos várias sub-áreas dentro, dentro disso. Eu não vou entrar em cada uma das bolinhas, aí, porque senão não, não dá. É, nós temos a área de mecânica dos fluidos computacional, que faz simulações 
né, de escoamento e tal. E nós temos uma grande área agora de ciência de dados. Por que, por que essa área é tão grande? São dois motivos. Um, porque eram duas áreas antes que acabaram se unindo, que era uma área de análise de risco, onde ficam os estatísticos e a, análise de inteligência, e a área de inteligência artificial. Mas como tinham muitas pesquisas que eles faziam em conjunto ou abordavam o mesmo problema, às vezes de for formas diferentes, mas era o mesmo problema, a gente acabou juntando isso num grande grupo de ciência de dados, que também é uma coisa que está em voga. Né? Para ajudar essa pesquisa, nós temos um supercomputador que fica... Né, que é, 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 para os, é para os pesquisadores usar, na, usarem. Na verdade, outros externos ao CMA também podem usar. Tá? Esse computador ele tem a, é o, o segundo com maior performance em universidades públicas no Brasil. Tá? É, ele vai ser dobrado, a capacidade dele. E quando ele dobrar, ele vai ser o número um. É, o, o equipamento número um hoje da Petrobras ele é bem novo, ele acabou de ser instalado. O número dois da, da Petrobras, acho que era 260 teraflops, Tá, só para vocês terem uma ideia, o, 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 o equipamento mais potente do Brasil hoje é esse novo da Petrobras. Né? O que eles estão substituindo é o que a gente vai ter. Então, é algo muito, muito importante para as pesquisas. Tá? E o CMA ele tem aquelas áreas de pesquisa, mas tem as áreas que, de estudo, né? onde a gente é, procura os, os problemas empresariais. Então, vai desde a da indústria, né? a, a indústria de base, ou a manufatureira, né? a indústria com a chaminézinha, quanto área, mercado financeiro, saúde. Nós temos alguns projetos com empresas de tecnologia, esporte, sustentabilidade, educação, a, o, o agrobusiness. Né? E uma coisa que eu acho que é interessante para vocês... Né? É, nós faz, fazemos um evento aqui que são os Study Groups of Industry. O que, que é isso? Nós trazemos a, a empresas, né? são normalmente cinco ou seis empresas, que elas trazem um, um problema real e fica durante cinco dias, é, mais ou menos fica de 20 a 30 participantes por problema para resolver o problema da empresa. Tá? É, é muito interessante, porque é um problema bem aplicado. Não é, tem, tem gente que compara com o um Hackathon. Eu acho que a principal diferença para um Hackathon é que o um Hackathon é uma disputa entre grupos para ver quem que vai fazer a melhor solução. Nesse caso, não é a gente apresentar uma solução. Às vezes, a, a, às vezes existe mais de uma abordagem, então existe mais de uma solução, que às vezes podem ser é, agregadas ou não. Mas é uma forma da gente relacionar com as empresas e, e elas conhecerem o trabalho e a pesquisa que é feita na universidade. Né? Como vocês podem ver, a gente tem empresas gigantes aí. A Raizen, por exemplo, que é o quarto faturamento no Brasil. A empresa com o quarto faturamento no Brasil. A gente tem Embraer, como a gente, Caixa. Como a gente tem empresas menores, às vezes locais, startups, que a gente também trabalha com eles. Tá? E a participação de, de pós-graduandos, principalmente, é fundamental para o sucesso desse evento. Eu tive que ser bem breve. Tá? Esse aqui é um resumo de uma apresentação mais longa, onde a gente detalha as áreas. Né? Mas quem quiser mais informações, a gente tem bastante coisa no site, no YouTube, no Facebook. Então, a gente coloca os projetos, a gente tem vídeos com os projetos, onde a gente tenta explicar de uma, uma forma mais simples o, o trabalho que é feito. Tá. Então, acho que era, era isso. Obrigado, Gustavo. Thank you. Uh, also, um, uh, I would like to thank uh, Maria Clara Fava on behalf of the, our students, because our clients, our customers are, first of all, are our students. So uh, Maria Clara is also hosting, co-hosting this, this course as part of her PhD. So your words. So uh, I just want to say thank you for you, for University of Sao Paulo. Uh, and CAPS to give the opportunity to Professor Dimitri lecture to the students here. And uh, mainly, thank you for Professor Dimitri to accept to come here and uh, enlighten us a bit more about modeling and hydroinformatics. Okay. So, muito obrigado, Maria Clara. Thank you, Dimitri. The floor is yours. So, thank you for coming. And the open lecture is open. Colleagues, I feel embarrassed uh, to see this slide because you put my uh, my uh, uh, face in the middle of 
so many different organizations. By the way, microphone is working? I don't think so. Yes, it does? And now it's okay? Same? All right. Um, thank you very much, uh, professors, for coming uh, to this lecture. It was a bit unexpected, so I'm not sure I'm prepared well. Uh, but I put some slides together. And Professor Mindyondo, thank you for inviting me. I really appreciate this opportunity to visit University of San Paolo, which appeared to be the best part appeared to be in uh, San Carlos. Uh, so thank you very much for this uh, opportunity. So actually, I see, um, I looked at this slide for the first time five minutes ago, and I tried to find out what attracts me in this slide. It's not the center, of course, but I like uh, this symbol of chaotic behavior of a certain system, as if it's an attractor, and this is, you know, <laughs> sort of predictive chaos a bit. This is uh, what I like, this is what we do in life. And also I see my role, so I'm this person here who came to teach uh, this uh, other younger generation, so I liked it a lot. I'm not sure what this symbol means, but perhaps it means uh, elderly people giving you know, knowledge back to a uh, young generation. And I'm sure a young generation would pick up all these ideas which we are presenting here and develop them further. And that's really what charges my battery to communicate with the young people. So really great. So thank you very much for yet another opportunity to come and to talk to, to the growing researchers, uh, master and PhDs. Right, but my role now is to talk about hydroinformatics. And uh, I would now switch, sorry, I put my microphone and switch to something else. Several words about our institute. You can consult education training guide, come to internet, and you'll find a lot of information on YouTube with all of these channels, reminiscence of students, what they did, and so on. So we're located in Delft in the Netherlands, so you see nice uh, places uh, in the Netherlands. This is our new building. I'm not sure I like it, but okay, fine. At least good people work in it. So uh, we uh, are postgraduate education, training, research, and capacity building institute working in the area of uh, water and environment. We don't have bachelor programs. We have 200 people in the institute overall and around 100 academic staff. We train every year around 200 master students starting every year, 200. We have 120 or 140 PhD students uh, at this moment. And overall, we train 700 or 800 people also if we include short courses and so on. So we have a lot of alumni, uh, uh, 15,000 alumni around the world. We train people from developing countries or countries in transition. I shouldn't say developing countries, I should say maybe non-Dutch because we don't have Dutch students, but we have students from all over the world every year, 65 countries people coming from 65 countries. Netherlands, low land. So maybe that's why this is in the, is, uh, in the ne Netherlands. It's a large transportation hub. We have largest port in the world, Rotterdam. We have a lot of infrastructure, but also a lot of water problems because water stands uh, that uh, high. You maybe know that why Dutch are so tall. You know, Dutch people are very tall. Why? Because they look uh, at uh, the sea like this, you know. That's why they grow so high. You see the Dutch industry is located below sea level, one third of the country, and most economic activity is below sea level, so if something happens, then we're in trouble. So this is largest storm surge barrier in the world, I think. It closes entrance from the uh, ocean, uh, this side, to enter high waters, uh, surge waters into the Rotterdam Harbor, uh, so uh, to prevent floods, and it's, uh, 10,000-year protection uh, from uh, coastal uh, flooding. And you see the houses are below sea level, so these pictures you see when you ride the bike, Maria Clara could tell you uh, that it's really wonderful uh, landscapes. But you see what may happen, sun is shining, but dike is breaking, you know, flood waters. This is Citizen Observatory. Again, Maria Clara would give PhD defense on Friday, so all come, you will know more how to collect data about environment. Dutch know how to do it. So our mission in the institute is to contribute to education, training, and research, and build capacity of di different knowledge centers uh, uh, around the world. Okay, we were established in 1957. You can read history, I will not go into it. But Delft University of Technologies played some role, but mainly Dutch government, who reacted to the request of um, ambassador of uh, East Pakistan, at that moment Bangladesh now, 
when there were catastrophic flood, they asked help from Dutch engineers to train their engineers. And this is what was happening. And since then, we grew quite considerably. And we're now a postgraduate institute. So our main activity is master program. It lasts 18 months. There would be perhaps new options for 12 months and 24 months. But currently, it's 18 months. So we have specialization. We have the uh, tr training phase and master uh, research and thesis part. This is most interesting part, of course. This is where people show their creati creativity. We run also a PhD program. We cannot award uh, degrees by law in the Netherlands. Only universities can award degrees. So we uh, work together with Delft University of Technology, and we award uh, PhD uh, degrees. We have uh, quite use, uh, wonderful facilities, so students feel quite happy hostel where they have uh, uh, separate rooms for each 20 square meters, so it's reasonable. Uh, now we have 70,000 alumni around the world from Brazil. You see quite a big uh, circle here, so quite many people were trained from Brazil as well in our institute. And what is most important maybe is network for life. Not only knowledge, but also connections, acquaintances, new experiences that uh, you sh come from different, don't drink, it's Camperinius here, some Brazil, uh, Maria Clara is somewhere here. Isn't, have you been to this party, hydroinformatics party? No, no, you were studying hard, I know, so you were not there. <laughs> anyway, so people learn each other and it's uh, friendship for life. Really, that's one of the most important components of this. We also organize special group training, short course and so on. So you're welcome to apply. We have 70 short courses, also online courses special group training and uh, so on, so you're very welcome to apply. Okay, Holland, nice place. Come to visit, tulips, uh, water, cows, bicycles, high-speed trains, uh, Paris is three hours from Delft. Delft, really nice city, like your city, actually. Very large technical university and IHE, of course. Many students, a lot of cheese, beer, uh, nice uh, people, and nice architecture. And Delft Blau, if you uh, want to buy. So that's about our institute in general, a bit of appetizer. So now let me switch to a bit more technical presentation about uh, any questions about IHE? No? Okay, come to Delft, I'll tell you more. All right, so let me close this one. And we switch now to this. So I'll talk a bit more about education and uh, uh, research. And uh, everybody says climate change, global change, so I was asked also to put it in perspective. And indeed, we have a lot of global changes happening, and it's important to, that we have also appropriate tools to react to these changes and to forecast their impact on society. So hydroinformatics started in Delft, in IHE Delft, actually, this, uh, where Michael Abbott, uh, professor of computational hydraulics at that time, coined this uh, term. This is our building in, uh, in winter. Uh, and uh, he is an author of quite uh, widely spread book, Computational Hydraulics, published in 70s, 90s, and so on. And at that time, he decided that information technology is the right way to look at things. And he connected hydro, water, and information technology together. So we uh, define hydroinformatics as information communication technology applied to problems of aquatic environment. Quite general thing, but I will give you a bit more details uh, in a second. So Roland Price replaced him when Mike uh, retired in 1997. Uh, he, by the way, was also organizer of the computing center of Danish Hydraulic Institute. It was him. Mike 11, Mike 21, and so on software is because of him, Mike. So he is actually was and still is a visionary who understand what will society look like in 15, 20 years from now and not talking about now. He's always talking about the future. So that's what many people learned a lot from him uh, in this uh, area. So if we define hydroinformatics in a bit more detail, we look at the study of the flow of information and the generation of knowledge related to dynamics of water in the real world and then technologies through integration of different technologies, modeling, information technologies, computer science, and artificial intelligence, 
and we take into account sustainability and social implications and all for smart management decision making for water-based systems. So we try to integrate data, models, and people. So we also look at this social component as well. Okay, we could talk about different books published and the special issues of the journals, conferences organized. Some companies have the name Hydroinformatics uh, in them or Hydroinform, which were organized by our graduates uh, from uh, IHE. We're proud of this. So we look at the world holistically and at technologies as well. So technologies span from data collection analysis to uh, different types of models being linked, integrated into chain of modeling uh, systems and then leading to better decisions made about water systems, for example, to predict floods or to find out what pipes are leaking in urban systems and so on and so on. So we look at data, models, knowledge, because we think models generate not data but knowledge, so because models in, encapsulate a lot of knowledge and then into decisions and uh, impact. So that's the approach we take in hydroinformatics. Okay, books, we talked about this some examples of our research projects, but uh, the font is so small you cannot read it, so I go to the next slide. So why hydroinformatics is important also for climate-related agenda? We follow the holistic approach, as I explained, so using all these uh, technologies. And since we use modern technologies, we could better understand the data that we observe in the real world, first, and second, to forecast the future state of the world. So. That's what we think uh, how most technologies should look like at this holistic approach, not only in water, in all other fields, to integrate different things uh, into a sort of chain of data collection, modeling, decision making, and optimization. That's what we uh, try to uh, do. Now, since we're educational institute, we do um, half at least of our work is in education. So we. Uh, in hydroinformatics, we run two master, maybe more master programs. So main, main part of it is indeed specialization of hydroinformatics and part of uh, water science and engineering program, which runs 18 and a half months. So that's our main, uh, main product, so to say. And then we also have uh, versions of this program which are in collaboration with Hohai University. Uh, in China and the Escuela Colombiana de Ingeniería in Colombia. So this program has just started, first people registered. And by the way, I forgot to tell you earlier, if you're interested, check their website and maybe you would like to come to IHE through them. So because you would start then first several months in uh, Bogota and then uh, this study is in English and then you come to Delft. So that's what we agreed with them to develop. And for the Colombian students, they have also the funding from uh, Col Ciencias and uh, Col Futura. But in Brazil, I think you have similar arrangements. So perhaps it's, we're thinking of establishing similar programs for Latin American market, maybe with other universities, maybe with your university. It's not easy to do because of bureaucratic reasons, but okay, we hope it will run. And then another program, master program on flood risk management, which is funded by European Commission. So every year we have approximately 20, 22 students starting this program and it runs for two years, uh, start in Dresden for uh, six months, then six months in Delft, then three months in Barcelona in Spain and two months in Ljubljana in, uh, in uh, um, uh, uh, Slovenia. So uh, then after that uh, we have six months MSc which is done in either of these universities or with industrial partners in Denmark, uh, UK, Brazil maybe. So we think of this. So please flyers are here. Everybody is welcome to apply. Why? Because we have fellowships. It's expensive program to pay from your own pocket. But if you're a good student, lucky and write a good motivation letter, we'll consider. Again, it's a very uh, competitive program. We have 400 applications every year. And we uh, give uh, 10 or 15 places for countries, non-European countries. The rest should be Europeans. Welcome to apply. Now, hydroinformatics. We talked about this already. So in our program, we start with fundamentals, always hydrology, hydraulics, environmental processes, but also data systems, remote sensing, GIS, cloud computing, software engineering. So these are some basics we do in the first half year. And then we move to uh, modeling tools. So we think modern engineer and manager should be able to use tools because they encapsulate so much knowledge in them. 
And then we train people in physically based simulation modeling. So these are lists of, t t t list of different modeling tools we use in engineering. So Sobek from the Deltares, Delft Hydraulics and so on, uh, sorry, the Danish Hydraulic Institute and so on. And then artificial intelligence and data-driven modeling. So I was happy to see on the previous slide all these words we will be, by the way, you will hear some lectures, some of them at least. So we use Vake, a neural machine, Python, Skylearn, and so on. And systems analysis, control optimization, decision support. These are three blocks, and these are application areas. And as you see, it practically covers all water-related areas. It doesn't mean we do everything deep, deep very much, because we don't have time, but we concentrate a lot on floods and urban systems also have specialized modules. And then we have topics on integration, and then last six months, MSC research phase. So that's our program of 18 months. Some titles of the MSC thesis, uh, look, I cannot read it all, but we apply artificial intelligence techniques for flood forecasting in Huaihe River in China, Genetic algorithms, again, uh, for management storage areas for flood risk reduction. I'll talk about this case in a second. Decision support system for European river flood occurrence and total risk assessment system. Optimal reservoir control in Vietnam. Flood inundation ma mapping in Bhutan. Modeling of water quality in Taihu Lake in China. Web-based decision support system in uh, Colombia smartphone and web applications for community-based disaster management in Ghana, and so on, and so on, and so on. You can read our website, you will find very interesting titles, and uh, many MSc theses are available online. And by the way, all our PhD theses are available online through repository.tudelft.nl. So all PhD theses for free you can download from Delft University website. What is the value of this MSc research, we think? is applying knowledge and mastering use of technologies and tool, work on real life project because most of our MSc studies are not theories but very much practical, developing project management and writing skills, communication with experts in various countries if you go to do MSc uh, uh, elsewhere but also in Delft, gaining real research experience, work experience, and uh, working with uh, important technological institutions uh, with their stuff. That's really great experience. Now let me spend some time on giving you some flavor of what kind of research projects uh, we did. Look, we had in master and PhD studies dozens uh, and also research projects for European Union, Dutch funding and so on, different projects. So this choice is maybe not optimal, but it will give you a flavor. One thing, this is Delftland. It's an area where the water is managed. Delft is somewhere here. Sorry, it's Rhineland. I'm sorry. Delft is here. It's Rhineland system. It's uh, north of Delftland. But it's very similar. So problem here is to pump out water. This is lowland. This is the ocean. Okay? The Delft is here. Rotterdam is somewhere here. So this is lowland. Water is pumped out from this land by huge pumping stations, which are here located, into the sea or into the rivers over here. So to keep water, lab, uh, water table uh, uh, low enough. Still, there could be a flood. When does it happen? It happens when your forecasts, these are uh, ensemble forecasts of rainfall. When rainfall is high, then water level goes up. So what we did, we developed anticipatory water management system, which is based on optimal control. And what we can show that that's an example of the past. Blue line is water level. It's below sea level. You see minus 60 centimeters below sea level. So what the level on blue line was what really, sorry, red line was, was really happening. And it exceeded alarm level, so it was flood actually here. Control was suboptimal. When we introduced our system of optimal control, we can show that our system allows you not to reach alarm level, so it means flood will not happen. And it costs not too much to switch from one to another. Simply why people were not doing this before. It happened, of course, during this flood uh, rainstorm peaks. So that's what we uh, tried. It's my colleague, uh, Dr. Schalkian van uh, uh, who did this in his PhD. We also use a lot of Earth observation data to improve our uh, modeling <laughs> capacity. So our <clears throat> student from China, Kun Yan, now he works for Deltares, actually. We were proud. He was hydroinformatics students with PhD title. He was chosen 
one person from 990 applications from around the world for that position in Deltara. So we're really happy. So our student, uh, so our students work now in Deltara. Several of them, hydroinformatics. So we used uh, uh, freely available uh, Earth observation data to improve flood inundation modeling of large rivers. So it's one example when we connect data uh, to models. In my water project, we try to integrate different information sources for better management. So what we did, we looked at soil moisture from different sources, uh, rainfall and so on, uh, satellite data, and it would be then integrated for better modeling tools. Yes, thank you. Thank you. See you later, yes, thank you very much. Now another project which you may uh, maybe not dealing with too much is using uh, neural networks to predict sedimentation in Rotterdam Harbor. So this is Rotterdam, this is the ocean over here, and water uh, f uh, ships come in over here through this entrance. So a lot of sediment happening here. Why? Because in France somewhere here, erosion of banks, lead sediment moves 600 kilometers to the north with the currents and enters uh, Rotterdam Harbor. So that's a problem. So I have to dredge here. How to predict sediment? We built neural network model, so it's data-driven model, to predict sediment three weeks ahead. So we can give better schedule for dredger, dredgers when and what to dredge in this area. So that's one of the examples, and it's published in different papers over here. Another example of linking physically based what we talked about already and neural networks model was to improve uh, ocean modeling. So it's 2D model uh, of sedimentation port of Rotterdam. So it's another model. This is the hydrodynamic model of Deltares built for the North Sea. So this is North Sea here. This is Netherlands coast. Okay, so this is a rough grid here, coarse grid. And here you have refined grid. Problem is that uh, you cannot run this block without getting data from here. So what we did, we trained neural network based on previous model runs to supply boundary conditions to this particular model. So it was typical hybrid, sorry, approach of hybrid modeling when we linked hydrodynamic model of Deltares and our neural network. This interesting application of data-driven models what we did here, so this is Delft over here, this is Rotterdam here, and this is largest port of the world, which is located here. Now, we want to predict ocean surge during bad weather. Uh, ocean waters go up and down up to two meters uh, difference. So the thing is that when boat ships come into the Rotterdam Harbor, large boats have the draft of 20 meters and depth is 21. So they're close to hit the bottom at this point of entrance. Ships are so big, why they're building such big ships, I don't know. But anyway, it's at the edge. If there would be 20 meters tall, the ships, they could not enter Rotterdam. So if surge is low, then the ships cannot enter. They're too big. So we're running neural network and chaos uh, modeling, uh, nonlinear modeling system to predict surge at these points using data collected in the ocean every 10 minutes Dutch measure uh, pressure, temperature, wind, and surge, water level in the ocean. So what we can do, we can predict eight hours in advance the water level at this point. Okay, this is too much. We don't have time to do it. So actually what we do, we move time series into phase space domain, and we build chaotic model <coughs> over here, and we can then predict not in time domain, but in phase domain. So we take neighboring points from the past phase portraits, and red line shows you future state of, of the of environment here. And for us, environment is the surge water level. That's what we're able to do. There were two PhD studies in this. It's a pity Deltares didn't pick up this research. We tried to promote this, but somehow I'm not sure. They said we invested so much in numerical models that we cannot switch to different types of technologies. Really a pity. It's an example for me was that uh, uh, the uptake of research is not always uh, easy. So, but okay, research was done. Okay, let's skip this. Now, Colombo, Sri Lanka, urban system rehabilitation. So they want to change some pipes to better pipes so that they would have less floods in Colombo. What to do? to run optimization tools. 
So what we do, we run optimization procedure here, and we run storm drainage system model, and we do it in a loop, and then we end up with the better urban system using uh, computation intelligence tools. El Salvador. Flooding is a major disaster. So what our graduate did, he developed neural network model to predict uh, uh, flood situation for Ministry of Environment and Natural Resources in El Salvador. So it's not that he built all of it. This center, it's a center at El Salvador, looks like this. It's great, actually. It's uh, high tech, very nice. They run different models. But what he did, he developed neural network model that they never did, and it works. In real time, it predicts floods. So I'm really happy to see it. In Holland, we don't have it, and they have it in El Salvador. So that's great. Droughts. Sometimes there is too much water, sometimes there is no water. So we have a drought. Climate change, all this stuff. So droughts is not the result of climate change. Droughts were always like this, and they, we observe them, and we can use past data, actually, to think more about these droughts. OK, let's skip this one. So one of our PhD students uh, uh, doing this now from Mexico, and uh, we look at different indicators how to measure meteorological, agricultural, and hydrological droughts using the uh, world data, So, because there is a lot of data. And what he is doing, he is trying to build analytical tools for better representation of droughts and better forecasts. So for example, this way, if you move from time domain into so-called phase domain, you can see that you know, drought system is developing like this, so you have more droughts in the world than in the past. And these visualization tools actually allow you to, to show that uh, number of areas and areas in total increasing when we think of droughts. OK, he is using different visualization tools. So that's uh, uh, Vitaly's uh, work. So I'll not go into details. I just want to show you that it's a lot of drought. Now, uh, also one of our master students built neural network that is predicting the crop yield. Uh, due to drought, crop yield could go up and down. It's in India, you see this, this area. So and in fact, neural network was able to uh, predict quite accurately the yield in years. So these are years from 67, 2011. So we're quite surprised to see quite an accurate result. Maybe the problem is uh, simple because it's, you know, it's just to predict one value for the yield for that year. But still, it gives you hope that even for more complex problems, data-driven models can be used in drought studies. OK, let's skip this. Now I would like to show you one example of smart management in reservoir operation. In Brazil, you have a lot of uh, hydropower, Itaipu, and uh, uh, so on. So you know better than I do. So what we did with this uh, four Chinese students in several years, we're building f flood control for optimal use of flood storage areas in Huaihe uh, using hydrodynamic models and computational intelligence for uh, uh, optimization. So the problem is this. Uh, in uh, Huai River, which is a river basin, is here. this is China. So this is Huai River Basin. And uh, OK, let's move uh, to a better map so that you can see it here. Right. So here you have uh, upstream fast flash floods in this area. The river flows like this. Middle section frequently flooded. And downstream, there is a sediment deposition in Hongsu Lake, poor drainage. So they have different types of problems uh, along the Huai He River. We concentrated on this area over here. And what happens uh, here, let me see, I have a better map. Yes, so in this area. So what we have here is this. So water flow is this way. There is a bang, big city at Bangbu, which is several million people, and it's frequently flooded. It's flooded because too much water comes from upstream. So solution is to flood certain areas here, you know, before these water uh, volumes would reach Bangbu. So Bengbu flood would be lower. Problem is, of course, there are 200,000 people living in these areas which are flooded. OK, so it's a compromise. Of course, the, the officials live here, and they want to minimize flooding of their houses. So there should be compromise found. So what we did, we built 1D model of this river. We also built, with students, 2D model of this river to look at flooding. <laughs> Because we wanted to assess the damage. So for this, you need two-dimensional modeling uh, of floods to damage here and also in Bangbu. And also, 
the main problem of optimization is this. When to open these detention areas and when to close them. So that for the forecasted inflow of this river, you would have minimum possible damage here and minimum possible damage over here. So it's multi-objective optimization problem. OK, it shows some inundated areas and so on. I will not go into detail. So we used 1D model. We used also 1D, 2D model. So it's 2D model, actually. And all of it was integrate, uh, modeled in an integrated fashion. And then we used optimizer over here. So multi-objective optimization routine, NSJ2, but also used other algorithms. That would run this model generating every time different schedules of opening, closing all these gates. So decision variables is this timing of open uh, uh, closing. So our objective was to generate then Pareto set. This is the Pareto level. So this is downstream risk in Bangbu, risk already including damages. And this is inund uh, inundated areas damage upstream. And we want to find this is Pareto set of all solutions generated, 1,000 solutions generated. So this one's a lot of damage upstream, but no damage downstream. When you open all gates and keep all the water upstream, but then you have a lot of damage upstream. And this is almost no damage upstream, but a lot of damage in Bangbu downstream. So people are not here. So we have to find some compromise solutions. So analysis was also which one solutions is to choose from this Pareto set of possible options for water control. Right, so it's a nice example when several students worked and uh, we used quite sophisticated technologies. So what is unique about hydroinformatics and IHE Delft? So let me get to conclusions. So we think we're able to combine fundamentals, advanced IT-based technologies, models, and artificial intelligence with practical applications. And in my view, its combination is unique. We have wonderful courses in theories, very much maybe courses in practical, but we try to combine this. Now, we do quite serious research, and we connect through our partners and through our students to practical uh, projects. You have to realize that our students are not fresh graduates. All of them, most of them are already experienced engineers or managers. So they bring also problems to us which we want to solve uh, uh, together. And we learn a lot from this, uh, our participants. So we have nice international atmosphere. That's great exposure to Dutch expertise in water. And again, our graduates form the effective networks for the future because they occupy many of our graduates from IHG in general, now deputy ministers and all this. So it's a good uh, stuff to do. Thank you, colleagues, for your attention. Vamos abrir as as questões. Uh, we are going to take some plenary questions because it's a motivational uh, lecture with several examples around the world. Also, the, the, the Delft uh, uh, flag is in all, all, in all this, this, this example. Uh, I would like to return to perhaps the first slides when you mentioned uh, the um, framework of joint programs. You are just starting with another uh, institutions like South America, uh, the Colombian uh, programs, and also for with the European program. So uh, I try to take the feeling from uh, one, one, our graduate pro, uh, student here. So what are the eligibility criteria you have in this case to select students, of course? This is uh, the normal question. Uh, what about the, the, the costs? But also, as a researcher and a scholar, I would like to, to know more how do you shape and combine to start a joint program? What are the eligibility criteria for new or another graduate programs to join perhaps new joint ventures with yes. you? Thank you. Yes, uh, good question. So there are several. So one, uh, uh, we accept uh, students with a bachelor degree in general for all courses at IHE. Bachelor degree, ELTS test 6.0, I think. So English, of course, uh, should be at a certain level. 
And, uh, you know, we say diploma from university of good standing, but okay, so it, it depends what you think of good standing. So we have many applications. Also, we look at motivational letters. You know, we, have to, we want to students that would manage this course. This course is not easy. And maybe one hour course is one of the most difficult because there's mathematics there and, you know, numerical methods and so on. So computer science. Okay, that's one. But it's true for all programs at IHE. So also this normal program of specialization hydrophonics, which is not joint, it's run only by each. Now joint programs, uh, we, uh, look, it's happening that our graduate uh, is professor at Hohai University, and at a certain moment we thought, why don't we start a program where people would spend some time in their own country, which is also uh, maybe easier for them because they wouldn't leave the country for one and a half years, so they would spend some time at home still. Also, it's cheaper because living there could be cheaper cheaper than in, in Delft. Okay, and uh, why not? So we tried with Hohai, it worked partly, but for 10 years we, and still we have 10, uh, sorry, five, seven students from Hohai only for hydroinformatics course and also some students for other uh, courses. Problem was that uh, to um, uh, what's the word? Accredit this program in China is not easy because for them it should be a new master program. So it didn't work out, so now we stopped this thing. Still, students are coming, but it's, uh, it stopped in 2017 because they didn't manage to accredit the program. People changed, so that was this thing. Escuela Colombiana, so Gerald Corso, because he graduated from there and he knows people there, Again, it depends on the people there who are enthusiastic. And they wanted to have this joint program for two years so that people would uh, start in Escuela and then uh, come to, uh, to Delft and then either do MSc in Delft or in Bogota. So that's, so how do we choose this partner? Because we trust these people. That's most important, the trust. And also enthusiasm and interest of them to do it. Fees is a difficult issue, so cost of our program right now, only tuition fee is around 21,000 euros for one and a half months, plus living expenses, which is 1,000 euros a month. So that's, you can add up, it ends up almost for 40,000 euros, so it's a lot of money. Now, fees then here, when they're in Colombia, are lower, so then there is an equation to calculate total fees. Partly in Colombia, partly at IHE, but diploma would be from IHE, so IHE handles all this, so somehow it, it's becoming a bit lower. Yes, indeed. But in Colombia, they got Col Sciences and Col Futura who are able to provide students with money to study in uh, good universities. You know, somehow they're funding their studies well. Strangely enough, fee was not a problem at that moment. Problem was organizational, how to organize all this. It's not easy because staff should come from computer science department. They don't know how and all this. So it wasn't easy. But now it's moving on. So first students would be coming to Delft next year. No, this year already. Yes. And the diploma is a double diploma? We used two options. This one would be uh, two diplomas given, one Bogota, one Delft. So we trust they give good education. They trust us. We give good give education. So we credit, cross credit our programs and we give two diplomas. In this place, we give three diplomas, one Dresden, one Delft, and one UPC Catalonia. Ljubljana not, because it's only two months there, so so, but maybe also. And the master thesis presentation is unique once? Once, all, of course. So some do it in Dresden, some in Delft, some in, in UPC, some in Ljubljana even. Okay, yeah, okay. yeah. So, quite complex arrangement. Any other questions? Or end of the day question is when do we stop, yes? <laughs> I know, people are tired. I, I tortured them. You're, you're very, very tired. I'm not, I could continue really, till... Really, no, really yes. you are, you are. Bottle of vodka and I could continue forever. <laughs> yes. But I see on the faces of students, they're, you know, good. I tortured them and they're good. Really, thank you for standing all this. Yes. Okay. Uh, only last question. This is the final, final question. What is your opinion of the challenge that you, you presented, the, the, the Mike Abbott? Yes. 30, 50 years beyond in the, front, in the future. 
for the future, what's your expectation about uh, integrating data, hydroinformatics, and society perception, trying to help in measuring? This is an, uh, I say it's an, a good direction of science, or perhaps it's an only a wave? Yes, no, look, I, I think, I, I think uh, society and science should connect better because often science is done uh, for, because we're curious in something and society doesn't accept it. So this interface between science and society should develop much uh, deeper, that's for sure. And uh, it's not easy because society doesn't understand science and science often doesn't care about society. That's a problem. But I think, uh, look, science often does things which are not immediately used by society. And I'm afraid it's inevitable. But however, if one-tenth of the science would do something that society would make quantum leap, that's enough. So you can allow science to do things which are not necessarily used by society, like mathematics. You know, many things are not used. But if you don't develop this intellectual capacity of people, which may be needed in case of emergency, smart people, uh, if you shrink science, society would suffer quite soon. So that's what I think. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, Maria? Okay, so we can make the, the summary and the, the wrap up and this our outlook for the first day. Uh, I would like to thank Professor uh, Dimitri Solomatini for his a warmful uh, uh, solidarity in terms of sh sharing his time. This is the first day after because he's only uh, shorter than one day. He, he arrived also when he's with his uh, wife here. So he has a very good uh, uh, energy for us. And we'd like to, to thank you and also welcoming uh, all of you tomorrow. Uh, making the, con the continuation of the, the, uh, the second day of the, the school. Thank you very much, Professor, and very welcome to Brazil, okay? Thank you. I also want to thank the professor Marcelo, the professor Junior, the support of the technical team of CETISC for this work. Without the effort and with Maria Clara, this would not be possible. So, we have finished this first day of the course. E convidamos a continuar amanhã. Obrigado, boa tarde, boa noite.